The name Imhotep translates literally as the one who comes in peace. The name is found earliest on the pedestal of a statue, cataloged now as Cairo J.E. 49889 of Pharaoh Djoser, who reigned from around 4,686 until 4,648 years ago, and in a graffito on the enclosure wall surrounding King Sekhemet's step pyramid, left unfinished due to his abbreviated rulership from around 4,648 until 4,640 years ago. This limited evidence, coupled with the popularity of Imhotep's cult from around 3,391 to 3,353 years ago during the reign of Amenhotep III during the Middle Kingdom era, until around 1,600 years ago, near the time of the First Crusade, was sufficient for Egyptian historian priest Manetho, writing during the Ptolemaic period, around 1,900 years ago, to posit that Imhotep had invented the use of stone-dressed architecture used in the temple complex of Saqqara, near the steppe pyramid of Pharaoh Djoser, where twin single stone lintels yet support a capstone eave to form a doorway, although this was, apparently, unattested to by the records of his own time nor by any of the subsequent pharaohs, even at the peak of Imhotep's cultic veneration during the New Kingdom from 3,550 until 3,077 years ago. Nevertheless, the continuity of Imhotep's mythic status within his cult, from its inception, sometime prior to around 3,375 years ago, when his libation ritual is attested to in an inscription prayer for the owner of a tomb, until at least the late period, from around 2,664 years ago until around 2,332 years ago, when the same ritual of libation is described in papyri associated to statues of Imhotep, is undeniable. The consensus of modern Egyptologists is that Imhotep's own, yet undiscovered tomb is somewhere in or around Saqqara, and the center of his cult is thought to have been in Memphis. Aside from the brief attestation of Manetho, writing around 2,750 years following Imhotep's death, of Imhotep being vizier, court magician, under Pharaoh Djoser, the primary references for source material about the life and times of Imhotep are even later works. The Upper Egyptian Famine Stele, from the Ptolemaic period, around 2305 until 2030 years ago, and a heavily fragmented papyrus, called now P. Carlsberg 85, written in Demotic script from the Tebtunus Temple around 1,800 years ago. Throughout this time and later, a syncretic movement in Greece and the surrounding Mediterranean regions sought to associate the Egyptian scribal moon deity Thoth with the Greek pantheon's messenger deity Hermes and because Imhotep had been titled a son of Ptah, and thus was thought to have been the living embodied personification of the deity Thoth, these latter-day Coptic Gnostics associated Imhotep with Asclepius, demigod son of Hermes, 
an inventor of medicine in Greek mythology. The evidence of this syncretic movement's influence on the cult of Imhotep within Egypt itself dates from the 13th dynasty, around 2,380 until 2,343 years ago, when Imhotep is first attributed with having healing abilities, as in the famine stella, curing Pharaoh Djoser's blindness. Manetho cites that during the reign of Djoser, the Libyans revolted against Egypt, and when the moon waxed beyond reckoning, they surrendered in terror. Papyrus Carlsberg 85 fragments indicate three parts of a single, much longer narrative describing the lifetime of Imhotep. I propose these three may be in interchangeable order. 1. The description of Imhotep's sister, named Renpet Neferet, called a daughter of Ta, in which Djoser attends a New Year's festival in Memphis, hears her voice, and invites her to dinner at his palace. The text indicates a young priest, Mer Hnuit, named Osir Sobek, is her escort through the palace's noble shrines, Nahoi Sebsi. But she becomes confused when she asks where she is being taken, and he replies he is taking her to his father. She weeps, thinking he is a ghost, and she dies the passage describing the cause of her death being too badly decomposed to be able to reconstruct. Her final words were, My brother Imhotep will destroy your soul. Further fragments indicate that Osir Sebek may have been executed as a result of this. A series of fragments describe the testimony of the Merhanuet to Pharaoh that a missing gold necklace presumably belonging to Renpet Neferet, was not stolen by him, saying that I did not take it or her, and that it was another girl, adding that perhaps she had forgotten. A small fragment attests to Pharaoh ordering a song be played on a harp and sung to ensnare the soul of the Merhanuet, and this then appears and complains, using the standard prayer formula, misery by night, misfortune by day. It is also possible the story of Osir Sobek was describing Imhotep as a young priest prior to becoming Djoser's court magician, her Teb. 2. The description of the reunion of Osiris's 42 limbs referring to the theft by Assyrian invaders into Egypt of 42 holy relics, presumably kept at Memphis in the tomb of Osiris, symbolizing the 42 gnomes into which the Nile region was divided, the majority of these being the small islands formed within the Nile Delta. Djoser and Imhotep desired to return these relics to Egypt so they stationed troops near an Assyrian encampment and instigated a fight lasting days causing much carnage and destruction. The Assyrian woman over whom the fight had broken out was brought to the Assyrian king who asked her, Is this good? About her deed. She replied by saying, in effect, If what I have done was wrought a magical spell, Allow me to continue to do so, and I will turn it to the king's benefit. She then engages in a magical battle with Imhotep, her counterpart magician among the Egyptians. First, she creates a totem figure of the Egyptian god Geb, and sends him to join the Assyrian army. But Imhotep creates one of the Egyptian goddess Nut, 
and sends her to join the Egyptian army. The sorceress then creates a great snake which was 100 divine cubits, causing destruction among the army, possibly on both sides. This great snake may be a symbol of the Nile River, or the Duat, the Egyptian version of the Greek river Styx, and was countered by Imhotep's possible prediction of an eclipse, or for a Menetho, Africanus, description of the moon waxing beyond reckoning to subdue the Libyan revolt against the Egyptians around that time as well. Finally, the Assyrian witch sends a magical fire, but Imhotep quenches it, possibly relating to the ceremony of pouring libations on the soil to make offerings to the Ka, performed by the web priests in honor of Imhotep offering the remains of the water bowl, all is attested to by the oldest text following his death to mention Imhotep, dating from during the reign of Amenhotep III, around 3,391 to 3,353 years ago, the father of Akhenaten. Imhotep then says to Sheshem Nefertum, an otherwise undenoted male individual, previously thought to have been the Assyrian sorceress herself, possibly in disguise, that he had not yet made a serious effort in the fight, and that if he chose to do so, there would be nothing she could do to stop him. In a later fragment of the story, the Assyrians have been rebuffed and reveal their cachet of the stolen Assyrian effigy limbs to have been in Ein Bel, the Well of Bel, presumably in Assyria, although possibly referring to Babylon. This fortress may have been in modern-day Gaza, as an Assyrian outpost near the Mediterranean coast, where the Canaanite god Bel son and heir of the Sumerian air god Enlil, was worshipped continuously, even much later, by the Philistine sea peoples, along with Dagon, the fish god, cognate to Sumerian Enki, or Greek Poseidon. King Djoser then went to Einbel to collect the limbs and return them to Egypt but on arriving had a prophetic dream, having possibly been written much later. The prophecy of this dream may be related to the subsequent King Inaros I, described as a son of Osiris, Wasir Wasir, who would, long after Djoser, invade Assyria again. In this dream, Djoser is instructed not to take the limb relics back to Egypt, but to leave them there in a temple he was to build for them, so they could be reclaimed later by that subsequent son of Osiris. Djoser then conveyed this dream to Imhotep, his court magician, Herteb. 3. The description of Pharaoh's blindness, cause not known, possibly later attributed to a coup, as related in Teptunus's version of the story of Ankh-Shashanki, in which Djoser's sight is restored by Imhotep, saying, here is the medicine for the eyes, plural followed by a fragment about a baboon doing something in relation to the eyes of the pharaoh that restores them to sight as clear as the shining pupil of the sun's eye. This may be related to Imhotep's architectural design for Djoser's home of rest of pharaoh, Hawaii wa na hetep na papur the first stepped pyramid design, the first building using stone bricks, 
and the first known use of upright stone lintels to support an eave, forming a doorway. It is known Imhotep also outlived Djoser and helped design the architecture of the stepped pyramid tomb of the subsequent ruler, King Sekhemet, which, although begun, was left unfinished due to the king's short-lived reign. The Upper Egypt Famine Stele of Djoser also preserves an account from the lifetime of Imhotep about King Djoser and contains how he had a prophetic dream. If this is a second prophetic dream in addition to his dream about building a temple for the 42 limbs in the Assyrian fortress of Bel's Well, or if it is the same dream, cannot be specified that inspired him to restore the temple to Kanum on the island of Elephantine, near the source of the Nile River, as doing so, he seems to have believed, would bring about an end to a seven-year-long drought. Because the Egyptian pharaoh, described in Genesis 37 through 50, is not named in the biblical text, it remains impossible to assuredly date the era of the story's events relative to otherwise known Egyptian history. Although the story of Imhotep's sister wife, Renpet Neferet, may seem to bear similarities to the story of Abraham and Sarah entering Egypt, wherein an earlier, also unidentified pharaoh is seduced by Sarah, in the biblical version of these events, Genesis 12, 10 through 20, Abraham is ultimately exiled from Egypt. Thus, it would be purely speculation to associate the person of Imhotep with the person of the biblical Abraham. However, the popularity of the myth of Imhotep by the New Kingdom and the contemporary first writing down of Hatorah during the Babylonian captivity of the Judean Hebrews, may have influenced the original authors of Hatorah to merge the myths associated with Imhotep in Egypt with the myths of their own patriarch Abraham. A more plausible connection of real pharaohs to biblical characters may be posited by a comparison between the seven-year drought dreamt of by Djoser, according to the Ptolemaic period, famine stele, and the seven-year drought, predicted by Joseph after interpreting a dream for an unnamed Egyptian pharaoh, Genesis 41, 25 through 36. The result of this was great prosperity for Joseph, whom was appointed vizier of that pharaoh, and was given the land of Goshen, in the northeast Nile Delta, around modern Fakus, a land heavily populated by Hyksos during the Middle Kingdom, where he settled his father, Jacob Israel, with his 70 immediate family members. Is it possible the legend of Joseph interpreting the dream of Egypt's pharaoh before a seven-year drought may be borrowed from the older famine stele of Pharaoh Djoser, describing his own dream to his vizier Imhotep at the end of such a seven-year drought? In Djoser's dream he saw Khnum, and in the biblical dream Pharaoh had seen seven kine, and seven ears of corn, rise up from the Nile, first a healthy batch, followed by an unhealthy batch that choked the healthy ones out. It is not impossible that certain elements of an Egyptian myth attributed to Imhotep by the New Kingdom were also adopted into the contemporary writing down of the Hebrew Bible such as the theme of Jacob interpreting Pharaoh's dream, the theme of him being appointed vizier for doing so, and especially the theme of a seven-year drought, 
mentioned verbatim in both contexts. If Imhotep is to be taken as the mortal human prototype for the Egyptian deity Thoth, then the three events describing his life in the Carlsberg 85 Teptunus Library of Papyrus could, and perhaps should, easily be taken as the basis for a model of Egyptian masonry, as an initiatory body, conferring ranks and offering esoteric or even occult knowledge. Such was, after all, very much the case for this individual during the first 2,500 years following his death, that a cult existed venerating him, even if only in effigy, as a source for divine wisdom. However, it is unknown today if, but probably unlikely that, this cult had any specific form of ritual work, or degree hierarchy involved in it, nor ranks for members, etc. Again, if Imhotep's role may be taken as authentically a grand architect of Egyptian masonry, the most permanent form thereof in human history thus far, then what can or should be said about his place in the history of the Pythagorean order of death if we attribute the foundation of the P.O.D. to Pythagoras, 2,570 until 2,495 years ago, but we addend to this that the order of death is the psychic conspiracy, it is the conspiracy behind all others, as stated in the P.O.D.'s Atlantean constitutions and in the P.O.D. manifesto, then at what point did this begin? I have elsewhere posited the Pythagorean aspect of the order of death, or psychic conspiracy, amounts to one half of the followers of Pythagoras taking a vow of silence following the study of his teachings and denouncing the other half, who did not do so, from the time of his death onwards. If this vow of silence was only taken on by the P.O.D. following Pythagoras, what may be said of the nature of the order of death itself prior to then? Was it a more open, more egalitarian social system, such as, apparently, had been the metaphysics of the cult of Imhotep throughout the peak of the ancient Egyptian empire? Was the metaphysics and parapsychological belief system of Imhotep alike that expressed in the P.O.D.'s Atlantean constitution and Egyptian masonry sections? Or did Imhotep simply manage the order of death at a moment in history when it could be more decentralized, more open and honest, and more communally shared among all? Were Imhotep's own dreams and premonitions ever alike the role the P.O.D. present him playing in the Egyptian masonry initiation rituals? Could anything alike described in the plays therein have ever truly happened? How logical is Egyptian masonry's moral, assuming it has one? Would Imhotep have agreed with the moral of Egyptian masonry? Would Pythagoras have agreed with the morals of the P.O.D.?